So for those of you who are just jumping on now, we have a poll here um, and we encourage you all to take a second if you haven't already to just register what kind of experience you have in project-based learning in the classroom. And we're not speaking here specifically about environmental project-based learning, but just generally um, with the tools and concepts involved with project-based learning. So if you can take uh, one more second or two here to join our poll and we can get a sense for who's in the audience today. And boy, um, from what we're seeing so far, it sure looks like we've got quite a range of experience um, as well as grade levels. So that's exciting to know that we've got a very diverse group out there. Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started and my uh, co-host here, Erica, will be broadcasting the results of our poll shortly. Um, but I wanted to greet everybody who has taken time out of your surely very busy schedules. We know the beginning of the school year, which is still upon us, is a busy one. So we want to thank you very much for taking time to join us and to learn more about environmental project-based learning today. Um, many of you who are out there know that one of the key tenets of the Buck Institute's flagship work in project-based learning is the essential starting point of the driving question. And you'll hear that again today, the driving question. So our driving question for this webinar is why environmental project-based learning? There are many dynamic contexts for project-based learning out there, but the environment is, in these times, a particularly critical one. So, as we all know, over the last decade, complex climate change, energy, natural resource, and biodiversity challenges have emerged as critical global issues. For the first time, our education system is being called upon to ensure that every student is educated about the environment so they can be better equipped and empowered to contribute to environmental solutions. Today, we are truly in the midst of a revitalized grassroots movement pushing for more environmental education. An evolving science pedagogy that reflects a shift toward applying content and scientific practices for real world problem solving and unprecedented emerging support at the federal level for curricula and standards that incorporate the environment. Before we dig in and get started on the content of our webinar, let me first briefly introduce you to your presenters. My name is Jennifer Tabola, and I serve as Senior Director for Education with the National Environmental Education Foundation. We are a congressionally chartered nonprofit that serves as a sister organization to the Environmental Protection Agency, and we are charged with expanding the agency's mission to educate the public about the environment. And I am honored to be joined today by Erica Baker, who serves as a lead consultant to the Pacific Education Institute, an organization that is training and supporting schools and teachers across Washington State to engage in environmental project-based learning. We are both passionate about the benefits of drawing upon the environment and project-based learning as a powerful context for teaching core academic, citizenship, workforce readiness, and stewardship skills. And we hope you will find today's webinar informative and inspiring to your important work. Um, I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Erica, who will help frame today's work together and also provide a few housekeeping tools so you can give us some feedback if you're not hearing us or if you need us to slow down or speed up. Erica, now over to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Erica Baker, and i um, really looking forward to talking with you all today. We are focusing on project-based learning, and in particular in the environment. As we move forward, um, I want to orient you a little bit to your screen. If you will look at the top of your screen, you'll see a little person waving, um, and that is your status button. And if you click on the arrow just next to that little person, you'll see where you can raise your hand if you have a question, and then you can type that question down in the chat. You can agree, disagree. Um, if you need to step away, you're welcome to let us know you've stepped away. 
If you're having trouble hearing us or if we seem to be too loud and, and your speakers are not adjusting correctly, you can let us know that. Um, in addition, speed up or slow down. Um, laughter, if we say something you find particularly funny. Or applause. What I'd like you to do right now is if you can find that button, please agree and let us know that um, you have, uh, oh, I see some agreeing. So let us know that you have located those buttons. Excellent. Okay, well, great. Um, and so as we go throughout, you're welcome to chat in the bottom right-hand corner. You'll see where Jennifer left you a message initially. Uh, we will be putting up some web links later on, and that will be a chance for you to ask questions. If it's a pertinent question to that very moment, you're welcome to raise your hand so we can stop and address it. Otherwise, all of your questions will be answered at the end, but you're welcome to type them and send them in when you, um, when you think of them. So, um, as we get started, you may be familiar with the Buck Institute for Educations or uh, the Pacific Education Institute's project-based learning models. Um, throughout the webinar today, you will see and hear about elements of both. Uh, for more details and explanation about any of these elements, you can visit the resources that we will highlight at the end of this webinar, and that will give you a little bit more detail and also a little bit more information about how to design some of those, those pieces. With that in mind, let's take a look at today's um, driving question. How can we use environmental project-based learning, or what we will refer to now as EPBL, to engage students, meet standards, strengthen STEM learning, and develop 21st century skills? Wow, that is a loaded question. So let's break that down into some smaller parts, and we're going to look at our need to know today. Um, these questions also happen to outline our agenda, so uh, let's take a look. First, what is Environmental Project-Based Learning, or EPBL? What is happening with EPBL nationally, and what are the benefits of EPBL? Then we'll take a look at what does EPBL look like, and where can I use EPBL? And finally, we'll look at what resources are available for planning and implementing EPBL, and in addition, we'll have time then for questions. So let's take a look at our first need-to-know question. What is environmental project-based learning? Well, environmental project-based learning, uh, just like regular project-based learning, has um, a key set of components, and it differs very much from an environmental project. And Buck Institute for Education, uh, they refer to those as dessert projects, and uh, project-based learning itself is a main course. So when you think about environmental project-based learning, the focus is on local ecosystems, frequently with a stewardship component. So um, kids are involved, teachers and students are involved with something local, whether it be on their school campus, a local forest, a local beach, etc. An environmental project, on the other hand, may or may not actually focus on a local ecosystem. And a good example of a contrast there would be focusing on a local forest or studying a rainforest and doing a project related to a tropical rainforest. Um, environmental project-based learning also tends to be more long-term, more than three days frequently, with much of that work taking place during the school class day, versus a short-term, one- or two-day project with a lot of the work happening after school. Um, those are those, you know, the diorama, creating something about a rainforest might be that at-home project. With that, um, I think the key component here, the key piece that really helps you, uh, helps us grasp what EPBL is, is that the learning takes place throughout the project. That is crucial. Versus a project, an environmental project where the project takes place at the end of learning, where it highlights, oh, here's what I learned about this topic. With environmental project-based learning, and I love this quote from John Larmer and John Mergendaller, it contains and frames curriculum and instruction. In other words, it is the purpose for learning. It, it, it gives kids a goal, a focus, and engages them as they go through the project. In an environmental project, it may demonstrate a concept or topic that they learn during a unit, um, or it could be just for fun. And those have their place as well, but obviously they're not project-based learning. So let's take a look now that we have a general idea of what environmental project-based learning is. Let's take a look at what's happening with it uh, on a nationwide level. Jennifer? Thank you, Jennifer. 
is to know, the first and foremost, the important thing to know here is that if you are interested in using the environment as a context for teaching whatever subject um, is your specialty or joining with others and collaborating on an interdisciplinary environmental uh, project, you are definitely not alone and there is huge momentum that is picking up a lot of speed and a lot of weight to really try to bring the environment into the classroom across the country. And what we thought when we were talking about this um, webinar was that it would be helpful to provide a context. And Erica is going to really focus in on what's happening on the ground and on the implementation level. But before we get to that, we really wanted to share with you um, what is happening nationally to influence and push for more environmental learning. Um, I think where we begin is really a bird's eye view of the national scene. And let's flash back for a moment to the year 2005 when Richard Louv's book, Last Child in the Woods, um, came out and the term nature deficit disorder was coined. Um, can I just see a raise of hands for anybody who either has this book on their shelf, has heard of it, or has used the term or heard the term nature deficit disorder? Oh boy. So yeah, I'm seeing definitely some people out there have heard of this. Um, Lou's book really catalyzed a national dialogue among parents, families, educators, communities, really about the effects of children spending more time plugged in and less time outdoors exploring. Last Child in the Woods argued that the current generation of American children is disconnected from the natural world and disconnected to such an extent as to be harmful to their physical, emotional, and intellectual development. And he proposed that nature deficit disorder may be avoided or reversed by enabling all children to have meaningful experiences in natural settings. What's more, he called out the necessity of cultivating these connections if our children are to be motivated to care enough about the earth and their place in it to make a difference. So this book really was one of the progenitors that got conversations started in preschools, in classrooms, in living rooms, um, in churches, and in community centers around the country as people realized that the digital era um, came along with some side effects along with urban development, suburban development that started to really reduce um, areas that kids could naturally get to in the outdoors. Um, on the heels of that, uh, the movement really spurred some legislative action. So inspired by Louvre, educators nationwide have really banded together to support the No Child Left Inside movement. And this aims to motivate Congress to incorporate environmental education into the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, also known, as I mentioned, as No Child Left Inside. With the grassroots momentum and the possibility of federal support behind institutionalizing environmental education, there is really an unprecedented opportunity to establish um, the environment as a core element of K-12 education. As a result of the No Child Left Inside um, uh, legislative initiative, the majority of states are now coming together or have already come together to establish working groups to write environmental literacy plans with the aim of incorporating environmental education and concepts into K-12 curricula. So you'll see here that most of the states in the country now have strategic plans for their state's education system to look at how to align the environment with existing curricula and standards. In addition, some of you may know that Maryland has really been a leader state um, in this arena. Um, in 2011, it was the first state to sign into law its environmental literacy graduation requirement. And they really were successful in doing this by leaning upon research to really make the case that environmental education has a positive impact on student achievement in core subjects, on student health, on stewardship, and also green economy readiness. Another important thing happened in 2011, um, which is it marked the second National Green Schools Conference that brought together over a thousand teachers, administrators, community members, corporate leaders, government leaders, parents, as well as student leaders to share strategies for transforming schools through environmental and sustainability education. Um, also, Arnie Duncan, the current Secretary of Education, was present and gave the keynote. And that really put a stamp on the movement as having some credibility um, at the federal level, which had really never happened before. So heretofore, environmental education really operated out of the EPA, but now it has a toehold at the US Department of Education 
and is getting support, which I'll talk about in a moment. And this third conference, the third annual Green Schools Conference, will take place this February in Florida. And they are currently accepting um, presenter applications. So any of you who had a lot of experience and would like to um, be in the role of educating others about how to use um, project-based learning in the environment may want to consider um, uh, applying for a presenter spot there. Um, also in 2011, again a banner year for environmental education, the U.S. Department of Ed took a major step to recognize environmental education by establishing its Green Ribbon Schools Award Program to honor schools across the country which have excelled in school-wide greening from the schoolyard to the facilities to the curriculum. This year, the U.S. Department of the Interior is formally partnering with the Department of Education for the first time to support schools to better access the unique physical environments of our national parks, our wildlife refuges, waterways, and other public lands to really position them as living laboratories for educational and professional development tools. So how this will actually be implemented um, you know, still remains to be seen, but there is a lot going on to try to really make these lands more accessible to schools and to educators, in some cases using technology, using visit um, public land managers coming into the schools, figuring out ways to broker field trips, um, so to really bring the science and, and uh, public land management alive for students and teachers. Another initiative that was established in 1999 is Hands on the Land, and this is a national network of over 100 outdoor classrooms on public lands and waterways that enhance K-12 education by providing field-based experiences um, for meaningful learning, and they connect students to America's great outdoors while exposing them to many of the issues that are confronting 21st century land managers. Um, it also provides opportunities to introduce students to natural resource careers, and also to foster, of course, environmental stewardship. Um, so K-12 students and teachers and families who are involved in this network are engaged in hands-on teaching and learning, utilizing local ecosystems that range from Alaska's boreal forests to Florida's mangrove swamps, from the southwestern deserts to the Great Plains. Um, there's an interactive website at www.handsontheland.org that provides a platform for highlighting projects sharing monitoring data, um, many of the partnerships there are involved in citizen science initiatives, and also showcasing best practices and educational resources for using the public lands as laboratories. So if any of you are interested in that network, um, it is um, something that is free to belong to, and there are a lot of resources and learning opportunities that come out of that. And if you are interested, I can certainly share more with you offline about that. Similar to what emerged over a decade ago within the corporate and higher education sectors, we now see our nation's largest school districts are creating the new position of district-wide sustainability or environmental coordinators. Um, these are professionals who are charged with systematically greening the curriculum, the facilities, grounds, and also achieving environmental health goals across entire districts. So these are just a few of the um, big school districts around the country that actually now have a position on their, um, at their district level that is exclusively charged with these responsibilities. So that is a major, that's just within the last couple of years. Most of these positions are really new um, as of the 2009-2010 school years. As the infrastructure for supporting environmental education in school grows um, and is being put into place, there's also been a new call for including environmental education as an integral part of science literacy through the next generation science standards. These new standards, um, I'm sure many of you are becoming familiar with them, but they do emphasize the development of skills that students will need in order to contribute solutions to 21st century problems, including priority environmental challenges such as the need for sources of clean energy, and the preservation of biodiversity and human health amidst economic growth. The opportunity to apply science, math, and engineering skills to important environmental challenges has powerful potential to motivate many students to continue or initiate their study of science and engineering, and we see great promise um, for these new standards in really allowing us to align the environment with other academic goals. Um, some of you had asked questions about STEM previously. Um, I wanted to share an infographic here that our organization developed um, really in response to polls that show that America's youth are, are deeply interested in the environment 
And while that is true, we know that 80% of our students are opting out of advanced science before high school. So environmental education, we believe, that is linked to real-world challenges can really improve student achievement and interest in science and related disciplines. We know that science, engineering, and increasingly technology will all be needed to address the problems of global environmental change that are confronting society today and in the future. And if, as research shows, 57% of STEM college students say that it was before college that a teacher or a class is what got them interested in STEM, then there is great need to expose students often and early to hands-on inquiry-based opportunities to learn and apply the skills that may one day lead them to pursue fields where not only is there disproportionately high demand, um, but there is also economic benefit. And importantly, the potential for making a tremendous positive difference for the well-being of people and the planet. Um, I am now going to hand off to Erica, and she is going to share some additional benefits of environmental project-based learning. And also now drop down and lead us through what it looks like on the ground. So Erica, I think we're ready to descend from the vision um, to the nuts and bolts of implementation. And I'll hand it over to you now. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. So with that, Jennifer has already highlighted a number of the benefits of environmental project-based learning addressing STEM and student engagement. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about a few benefits before we go into some detailed examples. Um, first of all, uh, one of the, the great things about environmental project-based learning is that it really does address those 21st century skills. And, and 21st century skills is somewhat new. Uh, I'm not going to say new. It's, it's a catchphrase these days, um, kind of like STEM when it first came out. Um, what I'd like is right now is if you guys will, will raise your hand or agree and let me know how many of you are familiar with um, uh, the 21st century skills. Just kind of let me know where you are on that. Okay, great. Got a few people replying here. Okay, so a few people are familiar. Some people are not as familiar. Um, and I understand some people are having trouble hearing me, so I'll make sure I, uh, I, I reach a little bit closer to the microphone. All right, so let's take a look at 21st century skills. And when you think about the project-based learning, it really does address a majority of these. With learning and innovation, in order to complete a project, to go through that process, it really requires the critical thinking and problem solving, communication, collaboration. And these are all crucial skills, as you know, probably in your careers today, as well as as we move uh, even further to a more global society. Information media and technology is a key skill. Uh, today's kiddos are more uh, wired in and connected than we could ever even imagine uh, would have been. And digital literacy, understanding media, and being able to use technology tools to collect data and analyze and represent it are, are, are crucial. Um, for career and life skills, if we think about where kids are headed, the ability to be flexible and to adapt, and that adapting is crucial these days with things changing so quickly. Um, being able to understand cross-cultural um, and cross-culturally, and to be productive and accountable, and then those leadership skills, of course, are really honed in as students go through a project-based learning um, type program. In addition, as Jennifer already touched on, the standards are also crucial. And those of you in the classroom know that standards, standards, standards are what you hear about these days. Um, with that, project-based learning, environmental project-based learning, really addresses quite a few common core standards. Now, because of the integrated nature and depth of EPBL, a number of these are, are addressed, but this is not by any means a comprehensive list. And it's also, um, it may have more standards than would be reached depending upon the project, the student needs, et cetera. And you'll see down at the bottom there the framework for the K-12 Next Generation Science Standards. The actual standards have not been released yet, but the framework does exist. And you can clearly see between the science and engineering practices, because essentially project-based learning 
is engineering design. Um, the cross-cutting concepts that go across topics and then the, the core ideas, particularly with life science because this is a environmental project-based learning program. All right, so let's take a look now at what does it look like. So our next need to know is what does environmental project-based learning look like? Well, we will use an example today as we go through, but um, really environmental project-based learning follows a particular process. The steps are not set in stone, but they typically go through this order, whether or not the teacher has a specific or general outcome in mind. For example, a teacher may know that she wants to involve or he wants to involve students in improving schoolyard habitat for wildlife. So there's not a set outcome, but something that will improve habitat. Or perhaps the teacher has in mind that, that this teacher wants to have students install a garden for schoolyard wildlife. So those both would go through this process. It's just the students, um, the, the con content knowledge and the student activities and then obviously the solutions would vary somewhat. So let's take a look if the kiddos were going to be installing a school garden for wildlife. So when you look at the project, first there's the engaging and connecting piece and that's when you get the kids hooked. Some usually, or most always, there's an entry event, something that gets the kids thinking about their school site, going outside. An example could be they become a creature and they have a little card or, or a list of what those habitat features would be for that animal and they have to figure out, does that animal, can that animal survive on the school campus? And then once the kids get out there and they start looking around and exploring, they think about their driving question. And the teacher works with them to say, well, what is our driving question? And in that case, it would be how can we install or what type of garden should we install to help wildlife on the school campus? And it could become more specific. Perhaps the kids decide they want to do it just for birds or just for butterflies. But somehow there's a driving question created. Then the kids are now hooked and they have a need to know. And that's when they create those questions to help guide their learning. Once they've done that, they go out and they describe the system. And that's crucial whether or not you're doing water quality testing or you're improving a garden on a school habitat. You want them to understand where is it they're working and what is already there. So they conduct the ecosystem description using some of those 21st century skills to be able to observe, to gather data and information. And then they begin to define the problem and they really clearly define it. The driving question guides the learning. The defining of the problem is the focus for the project. And then they research that problem. So as they go through that engineering design, they have that in-depth inquiry where they need to learn about, well, what are the native animals? What does belong here? What, what are the native plants? What should we have here? And in addition to that, I think one of the key pieces with environmental project-based learning that is really important for those kiddos is the understanding the stakeholders piece. So here they know they have a problem. They want to put in a garden. Well, a lot of times kiddos don't necessarily think beyond themselves. So it really gives them a chance to understand who is it that cares about the project. Who is going to have a stake in this garden, in this spot, at this school? And so kids learn about the administration, the uh, grounds maintenance, other students, community members, et cetera. And they get a, a, a better understanding. So as they prepare and, and determine possible solutions, they then have some voice and choice, but also understanding that they have to persuade others and they have to convince others and they need to design it so it works for everyone. With that, there's the continual revision and reflection. They're having to rethink. They're going back into the significant content to think about how are we going to determine solutions. And then those 21st century skills really come in as kids work as a whole or in parts to then develop and implement that plan. Well, what will this garden look like? You know, Susie and Johnny have a particular idea and Bobby and Sally have a particular idea. So how do we merge all that together to create one garden that meets the needs? Once they've implemented that plan through an action project, that stewardship piece, it's the best part, right? The kids then get to showcase that. They summarize, evaluate, and reflect, and say, this is what we did. This is how we made a positive impact on our schoolyard or in a local you know, uh, park or whatever it may be. And they showcase that. And they have a public audience. So now it has meaning. It's real. And so as in a whole, they have gone through an entire project that has enhanced their skills, 
given them that content uh, they've gone through and learned a lot about whatever the particular topic is and they've accomplished something that they now have ownership of. So that's one example, but sometimes I hear from people, well, I don't have a big lush schoolyard. We don't have grass. We don't have a place to put a garden. But environmental project-based learning can happen in small spaces and that's what's so great about it is you don't necessarily even need a patch of grass. You can do a planter box, for example, if you look in this bottom corner. It still provides and enhances habitat. You're in the middle of New York City. I've heard a lot lately about rooftop gardens, about you can put out pollinator uh, nesting boxes, and, and different uh, components that the kids still have ownership. They still go through the process. It's just a little smaller, the end result. And so they can still provide those habitat features. So with that, let's take a look at a couple other examples, if my computer wants to work. So on a bigger scale, so we've talked about what could happen on a small scale. Let's look at a, at a larger scale. This is a stream bed restoration example. Now, um, this actually came about because the city uh, was doing some work on the school property in an adjacent area, and they destroyed a stream bed and a wetland area. And as a result, the school was flooding. They were having some flooding problems. And so what's really great about this is this was real. This was a real world project. The kids had to make a difference uh, to, to help. And so the teacher got involved, local community members got involved, and they were able to then uh, go through the process, go through the um, project-based learning model where the kids actually just explored the ecosystem, learned about what's supposed to be there, how what how wetlands work and, and avoid flooding and those types of things. They had to design uh, possible solutions and the great thing is then they tested those solutions and they really looked to see is this working and what will and won't work. And then once they went through and proposed a solution, they had to present that to the school board, to the city, it got approved and then they involved volunteers, community members, and obviously uh, peers to get out there and actually restore the stream bed. And in that bottom right hand corner you can see what it ended up like. And so that was a great example of understanding stakeholders, going through a process that's real, and the kids definitely had some need to knows, and they definitely learned some content. Another example of off-site, so you can do some on-site, and I do want to clarify, there was a question earlier that um, can this involve water quality? Can it involve doing something else? And yes, these are just some examples that um, have been done on-site and off-site, but this can involve any type of project related to the environment. In this case, it involved an interpretive trail, so it wasn't necessarily doing restoration, removing invasive species, but it was actually creating an interpretive trail to educate people about a local coastal forest. And so student teams designed different sections of an interpretive trail through this native coastal forest. So their need to know is involved what makes a coastal forest a coastal forest. Why is it special? And then they had to go out and they went through this ecosystem to find those key components. So as they created their trail, they made sure to highlight those key components. And then they had to understand the stakeholders because the stakeholders were the ones with the money. They received a grant to do this and so the students had to then show the community members, the board members, that this is how we think the trail should go. And with that, because it was different teams, each team had a different section of the forest. So they had to collaborate and communicate to determine how those would hook up to create one cohesive trail. It was a valuable experience for those kiddos as well as for the community members and I think everybody benefited and they still use that trail today. So while those are some big projects, there are some simple ones that can be done on, just simply on the school campus for little to no money because that's another thing I hear quite a bit is, well there's, you know, we don't have enough money to do this or we don't have enough community support. Uh, kids can build and install or mount birdhouses, nesting platforms, bat boxes, etc. So any kind of home or nest box for creatures. A water source is a simple way to enhance habitat and I've even had that happen in my own yard. You put out a little uh, tray of water and suddenly you'll see more wildlife than you ever expected. Uh, you can create and put out feeders or feeding stations and this is where knowing your stakeholders is important because some schools may or may not uh, want 
to have food out for animals that is intentional. So then you would think about gardens. Um, removing litter or removing invasive species is always a great project to do for the environment. So, um, you know, there are many others out there. These are just a few to think about as we go through talking about uh, project-based learning in the environment. And with that, now that we have all these great ideas, wow, well, how do we do it? What resources are out there? And now Jennifer's going to talk to you a little bit about resources for planning and implementing environmental project-based learning. Thank you, Erica. Um, I want to get outside right now and <laughs> be working on some of those projects that your beautiful uh, photos revealed. Um, fortunately, there are, in fact, many resources that are out there. And Erica was kind enough today to put together a um, one pager and a link to that, which we, she will be entering into the chat box so that those of you who are listening don't have to furiously write down the resources that we're going to share with you and or come back to the archived webinar to dig those out. So um, thank you, Erica, for doing that. So yes, there are many resources, and we are going to just highlight a few here that we hope can be helpful to you as you uh, get started with environmental project-based learning. So first of all, with our organization, um, our website, classroomearth.org, is run by the National Environmental Education Foundation. And it was really established as a resource for teachers who are working across every different discipline to be able to have a searchable database to look under topic or subject or grade level to find what it is you need to teach about a particular environmental topic. Um, so if you go to classroomwork.org, you will see you can enter in, I am a fifth grade teacher, I want to talk, I want to teach about climate, and I would like to be able to reinforce math skills and put in those three variables and then we aggregate resources that are scientifically based and aligned with standards from across the country and, and house them there. So hopefully that can be a great resource to you. Additionally, we provide a regular free newsletter um, as well as social media feeds if you connect with us that highlight national environmental education funding, um, awards, competitions, as well as professional development opportunities for K-12 teachers, educators, and also students. So that is a great resource to get yourself started and to make sure you don't miss out on resources that could support your work in environmental project-based learning. Another um, resource I wanted to share with you is our National Environmental Education Week. And in 2012, NEEF embarked upon a new multi-year effort to really position the environment as a meaningful and powerful context, really, for teaching STEM skills. And so our theme is greening STEM. Last year, we took a broad brushstroke uh, across a lot of different resources for reinforcing math skills, reinforcing science skills, um, engineering and design skills through different environmental projects. This year, um, I hope you all will stay tuned as we will showcase how there are new opportunities springing up all the time um, to take technology outdoors to enhance environmental projects. So be it geocaching, some of the new downloadable apps that teachers are using on smartphones and tablets, um, whether it is um, using Skyping um, and or webinars to bring experts into your classroom who can help enrich the time that you are outdoors, there are all kinds of new resources, um, and we are hoping to highlight those and really show how they can help and en en uh, enhance and enrich your teaching of the environment. Um, I also wanted to mention the Environmental Protection Agency, for those of you who don't know, provide amazing resources for teachers. Um, they really focus in on some key areas, and that are, those are air, water, energy, and waste. And there are also, again, resources, awards to recognize teachers for incorporating the environment into their classrooms, also awards for students across the country. So if any of you have outstanding students, um, there's a chance for a national recognition that comes through the EPA. And there are also grants um, that you can apply for to help support either your school or district um, to integrate more environmental education and projects. Um, another new resource that has just been established through the Green Ribbon Schools Initiative at the Department of Education is the Green Strides webinar series. And 
it's rather overwhelming if you go to the site because there are so many. It's really like a potluck for federal agencies to all bring um, their resources that are supportive of greening schools across the country. And soon um, those will be followed by national nonprofits that have initiatives. I mentioned, for example, um, when some of you were asking about resources for habitats on schoolyards, um, for example, um, the National Wildlife Federation has an amazing program to support schools um, and to get recognition for their work with schoolyard habitats. And so they will be doing a webinar down the road. Um, we actually, NEEF will be joining EPA next Wednesday, October 3rd, um, to really look at resources for supporting environmental education, both the EPA has and that we have, and we'll take a deeper dive. So I really encourage you to check that out and see what might be useful to you and your colleagues. Um, and now I believe I'm going to hand it off to you again, Erica, um, to share some additional resources. Um, before I did that, one last thing I did want to mention. Um, uh, Donors Choose, for those of you that are familiar with that organization, I want to do a special shout out because I just learned that they just announced a week or so ago that they are doing some phenomenal matching grants for in, exclusively for environmental projects. So uh, the money is there until it runs out. It's a significant amount of money. Um, and I think the gateway um, you know, to applying for it is relatively slim. It's not a huge application process. So I definitely encourage you to check that out. And while Erica's talking, I'll try to get a link up for you. And now I'll turn it over to Erica. Super. Thank you, Jennifer. So um, another resource that uh, you can take a look at is the North American Conservation Education Toolkit. It was put together by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, so it's a national level. And um, on this toolkit, you'll see the link below, but again, it's also on the handout that we gave you. In the bottom corner, there are lots of resources, but in the bottom right-hand corner, you will see a few key resources that can um, assist you as you go through looking at how am I going to design and put together this project? What resources do I need and, and, and what steps can I take? And the landscape investigation guidelines um, really are a more social studies focus at looking at uh, the environment through project-based learning. And then we have the schoolyard biodiversity investigation, which can really, it can use, it goes along with the field investigation model. Um, if you're familiar with field investigation, scientific inquiry, and it can be used as a, a key piece for looking at an ecosystem and doing that ecosystem description, understanding what is the biodiversity of our school sites so that if they want to improve biodiversity, they're aware of, of where they're starting from. Um, fostering outdoor observation skills is a great so source or great uh, resource, especially working with younger kiddos, really getting them to stop, look, listen, feel, and capture and, and explore their surroundings, and then record that information. How, to, how do you get a first grader to make observations and then get that down where they can communicate it with others? And then at the very bottom, you'll see the project-based learning model link, and that's the Pacific Education Institute's project-based learning model. Uh, it takes kids through that engineering design process, that process we talked about earlier, in a very general context. It can be used for anything uh, dealing with the environment. Another place to access those is on the Pacific Education Institute's website. And if you look um, on the main page, when you get to the main page of kind of, you know, halfway down, you'll see those resources again highlighted and they link to the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency site um, as far as those documents. They'll come out up as a PDF and then you can save them to your computer as well. And I encourage you with the Pacific Education Institute, we have a number of resources um, under Learning by Doing um, and, and the resources section. And it could be really great to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, um, one of our, our, our director of that group. Um, we have an individual who's very good at posting wonderful opportunities, information, and resources on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. 
And then, of course, the Buck Institute for Education's website. And all of you are at least somewhat familiar because you went through the website today to get to this webinar. And BIE has a, a lot of great resources and tools that you can access, articles and information, uh, to be able to get a deeper understanding of those essential components of project-based learning and, and how that, what that can look like in a variety of different contexts uh, beyond just the environment. They do have something that is relatively new, and uh, it's in its first year. It's very exciting, and it's pblu.org. It is associated with the Buck Institute for Education. It's an online program in which you can pick a project and take classes related to how to implement that project. And this is free. Uh, the classes are continually rotating through two-week cycles. It's kind of one of those online, do-it-on-your-own type of classes. Uh, take the classes you want. And if you take all five classes and uh, go through the Schoolyard Habitat project, for example, the one we have highlighted here, you then can uh, you can get a certificate. You finish up the capstone course, so to speak, and you will have guidance as you go through that project by doing it through pblu.org. So I encourage you to check out that website. If you do sign up, you can then download the Schoolyard Habitat project, and it is a resource going from beginning to end, talking about scaffolding and managing the project. It provides handouts, uh, documents, so you can your first project-based learning project in the environment is mostly done for you and you can go through that process and see what that's like before you jump in with both feet on your own. So with that, speaking of jumping in with both feet, I'm sure there are quite a few questions left about uh, the process, perhaps um, where to go next. Um, hopefully you're all excited and ready to to run out the door and get some kids involved in projects. So at this point, there were a couple of questions. Um, and uh, feel free if you want to raise your hand or you can just type a question. We'll give you just a second to type some questions into the, the chat. But there was a question earlier about assessment. So I'll address that while people are th thinking of other questions. And I believe it was Diana asked about how do you assess learning and if there have been any uh, studies on student learning uh, compared to regular classrooms. And I'm sure Jennifer can also respond to this, but I will say the Pacific Education Institute on our website, you can find a report that looked at student performance on our standardized test here in the state of Washington. And it compared students who were involved in environmental investigations and learning versus those who were not. And it did show increased understanding of systems and content as well as process. And so you can find that report on our website. And um, there are a number of other, I will say, just in the anecdotally, with the people I've worked with this year, I've talked with several different teachers who have had their kids involved in in-depth projects, and we've seen test scores go up as much as 15%. And, and granted, that's standardized test scores, but that is one way to assess. But um, Jennifer, do you want to address that? Because I know you have your finger on the pulse of research um, and information. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, yes, yeah. yeah, so we are actually looking at um, research that's coming in um, from a group called Peers, which is looking at place-based environmental learning, which obviously has much in common with project-based learning. But um, I mentioned earlier this idea of utilizing public lands, which can range from schoolyards, which are public lands, um, to nature parks, to state, um, city, and national parks. And as I mentioned, there is this renewed interest in really um, connecting young people with the great outdoors and you know, positioning um, lands as real learning laboratories. And so I can um, put, try to pull that up and put a link, or you can certainly reach uh, me via my email um, or our website, and I'd be happy to send you um, that report. That's something new that has just come out. but. It definitely um, demonstrated that the retention of the science learning was stronger, and there were some um, re there was some research there that was also done around um, high poverty schools as well. And another uh, piece I wanted to mention, and we need to learn a little bit more, but I know the Buck Institute partnered with Edutopia to take a look at how 
um, the AP environmental science exam could be taught through an environmental project-based learning approach. And I believe that the preliminary results um, were very strong. And again, they really were looking at diverse um, classrooms, so not just high achievers and those who had uh, less diversity in their ranks of their students, but really looking at can you take this project-based approach and apply it to something like an AP exam and include students who may not typically have been um, succeeding with this and really get good results. And I know that, um, just, uh, uh, Erica, you can chime in, but I know that the beginnings of the research um, were, were being shared at Buck Institute's uh, PBL World uh, International Conference last June. So we can also look for that and see if we can um, share something with the link for it with the uh, archived webinar. But those are, are two reports that on the top of my mind are new and are coming out to give more weight to the value of this approach. Definitely, Jennifer. Thank Definitely, you. Jennifer. Thank you. And we had another question about uh, releasing control versus providing scaffolding related to project-based learning. And so I do want to clarify that as kids go through the project-based learning process, as they begin to explore the environment and, and conduct an ecosystem description and then define the problem, it is set up in a way that is structured but allows for individual voice and choice. So you're giving the kiddos a scaffolding by providing them the context and the content and then guiding them through some of the, the uh, collaboration, decision making, and, and getting them to be the ones that want to learn as, as they go through that process. I really encourage you, if you're still wanting to see what that scaffolding looks like, is to look at either the Schoolyard Habitat Enhancement Project through PBLU.org. And once you sign up, you can, can access that. And again, it's free of charge. Or you can get it from the Pacific Education Institute's website. Are there any other? I'm seeing some great conversations taking place and, and great input. Uh, Peggy just uh, posted a, a wonderful uh, website. Are there any more um, questions directly related to project-based learning, uh, possible projects, or um, the implementation? I'm seeing some people type, so we'll wait just a moment. Okay, so with that, while people are finishing up a few questions and thoughts, um, wanted to just reiterate who we are, and, and you can reach us through our websites. There are some Contact Us um, tabs that you so you can um, get in touch with us if you ever have questions or um, want more information. Um, oh, and we just got a great question. Oh, huh, that was from Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer is interested in knowing, um, are any of you interested in, in or pursuing PBLU certification? So what I'd like to see, and that's a good question, Jennifer, if you're familiar with PBLU, if you will agree or disagree, if you're familiar with PBLU.org, that would be nice, interesting to see um, as people came through. Oh, I do see some people that were interested, that were aware of it. Super. All right. Well, I wanted to share this quote with you as we wrap up today. Um, and just to let you know that, uh, that we appreciate you coming on today. We know you have very busy schedules. And uh, we're really encouraged to see the number of people that were, were logged on today and really excited to hear in the future where, where environmental project-based learning takes kids in the environment. Thank you so much for your time, and at this point, if you don't have further questions, you're welcome to log off, and if you do, uh, we'll be here for just a couple more minutes. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Choice. Thank you, everyone. We really enjoyed the chance to reach out to you. And obviously, we're very enthusiastic about this topic. And we hope after today's webinar, you are too, and that you will um, get started and try it out and get in touch if we can be a further help to you. Have a great rest of the week and a terrific weekend. And we hope it includes some time outside.
And Diana asked another question, so we're just going to stay on for a minute. If that's okay, it'll be easier to answer her question. She wanted to know about and get an example of how to connect kids to the information about stakeholders. And that's a great question because if you go to some stakeholder websites, they're not particularly designed for students to um, read them. So what I tend to do is make phone calls and contact those stakeholders, prepping them for these are the types of things kids are going to want to ask you and get an understanding about, and then encourage them to come in and be interviewed, either in person or via a web chat or even a phone call. And that's a great way to get those kiddos really thinking about, oh, those stakeholders are a real person. Because another thing that happens on the internet, particularly with younger children, is it's just this page on the screen. They don't realize there are people connected to that. So one great way to do that is to have that in-person contact. Another thing I've done in the past is taken some websites and, and I will glean that information and the key pieces and rewrite that in a student context so that it uses the wording and um, sentence structure that, that students will understand. And obviously as they get into high school, that changes a little bit. You want them to be able to discern information from a detailed website. So it, it changes as you get in the older grades. And so, but I still think that personal connect even at the high school level is really important with at least one of the stakeholders they're working with. I just wanted to follow that up uh, by uh, briefly talking about a project I heard about where one of their ways of taking a first survey of the environment around the school was to identify some of the senior citizens who were living um, around the school and to bring them in to talk about what that area looked like when they were growing up. Um, and to really give them sort of a, a snapshot of the changes and to really contextualize um, what they felt were positive changes and what they felt um, were things that they really missed about the natural environment that perhaps used to be there, as well as some signs about what may be um, positive directions. And it was so successful that they actually ended up having the seniors join them um, for one of the field trips. And so they connected with one of the assisted living um, centers, uh, rented a bus and then the school bus, and then they went out on a field trip to the nature center together um, to explore some of the resources that now were housed at the nature center, but really the objective was around the schoolyard habitat to look at how to um, refurbish and bring some more biodiversity back into the immediate school grounds. So um, in terms of stakeholders and really doing some qualitative research, that was a great project and very inspiring to hear about. Well, with that, thank you all very much. We need to wrap up now and have a great afternoon. Thank you. And